Hello, my beautiful doves. Today we're going to be talking about the costume design in the new Netflix TV show called The Queen's Gambit. I had no idea what the show was about until I saw it on the Netflix homepage. And why was I on the Netflix homepage? Because I was desperately looking for something to cleanse my brain from the disaster that was Rebecca 2020. Um, if you haven't seen it, consider yourselves lucky. And I'm going to be honest, I really loved it. I binged it all in one day. I can totally understand for anyone who's on the fence about whether or not to watch it because the synopsis does sound boring as hell, but I can promise you, you don't need to know anything about chess to enjoy the show. Will you enjoy it more if you know what they're talking about? Yes. I didn't know what they were talking about and I still liked it though. So I think it's possible that you can have a good time without being a chess enthusiast. I will say though, just to manage expectations, this show does have a diversity problem in the sense that there's only one person of color and she's like put into the best friend role, minor character role. So uh, just keep that in mind. I still enjoyed it because I like Anya Taylor-Joy. She is a joy, but uh, does it have a diversity problem? Yes. Without further ado, let's get started. Let's briefly recap. The Queen's Gambit is based on a book of the same name by Walter Tevis, published in 1983. The show spans over the course of several years. I was kind of annoyed how they picked and chose when to tell us the dates, but from my calculations, the main events take place between 1956 to 1968. I actually love TV shows that span over several years because I feel like in the way that we talk about fashion history, a lot of the times people will categorize certain trends into decades and that's not always accurate because fashion has evolved slowly over time. It's not like, oh, January 1st, 1920, let's bring out all the flapper dresses. Like that's just not how fashion works. And I think that's important to note. And the show did a good job on that as well. The main character, Beth Harmon, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, is an orphan who develops a love and natural talent for chess. The series is a coming-of-age drama and follows her journey as she struggles with family and identity problems and substance addiction, all while aiming to become the best chess player in the world. One thing I will say that I didn't like about the story is that I feel like all the characters gravitated around Beth like she was the son or something. And it just didn't make sense because I think she's a likable character to the audience, but she's pretty insufferable to the other characters and especially to her friends. So it just doesn't make sense in my perspective that her friends would just all show up for her when she needed them the most. She's super condescending to Dudley Dursley, yet he keeps coming back to check in on her, which doesn't make any sense. He even flies out to New York City in the finale to get on that group phone call to help her win. Benny has similar complaints, tells her never to call him again, but eventually comes around and calls her. Though granted, I wasn't too shocked by that because I feel like Benny and Beth were the same brand of messy with their personal relationships. But Jolene was done so dirty. We haven't seen her for like six hours now, and she literally swoops in at the end randomly to save Beth. You're like my guardian angel. Jolene does so much for Beth, it's crazy. She even uses her hard earned money to send Beth to Moscow. It just doesn't make any sense. And now that I got that off my chest, let's look into the clothes. The first part of the series takes place in 1956 in an orphanage in Kentucky. Beth wears the same outfit consistently for this part, a schoolgirl dress and a pinafore until she gets adopted in 1963. When she gets adopted, she's enrolled in a new high school. Here we can really see the difference in fashion between Beth and the popular girls. Unlike at the orphanage, where all the girls are dressed exactly the same, we can clearly see how Beth compares to her new classmates. They immediately make fun of her for her clothes and shoes. I see you, Harmon. It's those shoes. Did you get them at Ben Snyder's or something? I wouldn't be caught dead in Ben Snyder. Beth sticks out like a sore thumb with her very stiff looking straight long pinafore compared to these girls in their tailored shirts, sweaters, full circle skirts, and saddle shoes. Even though these girls' outfits look almost identical to 1950s Halloween costumes at Party City, they're actually pretty accurate for the time. In the early 60s, what we think of as 50s fashion was still spilling over. The full skirt was still pretty popular, and it wasn't till the mid-60s that the mini skirt started to dominate. Also, we have to remember that Beth grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, so her peers are not going to be as fashion-forward as the girls in New York City or London or Paris. 
Alma eventually takes Beth to Ben Snyder's for some new clothes. Ben Snyder was a real and popular department chain with stores in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky. Interestingly enough, the founder Ben Snyder was a Russian immigrant, which is a pretty happy coincidence. As Beth wins more competitions, her capital also grows, and we can see this reflected in new clothes as well. I love that she still wears her outfits several times throughout the series, sometimes styling pieces differently because it makes the show seem more realistic. Do I complain if the costume designer is consistently churning out good, amazing, talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular, never the same, totally unique, new looks? No. But I do appreciate when characters rewear clothing or outfits because I feel like it makes the character seem more real and you can kind of distance yourself from the reality that this character probably had like a $10,000 budget for clothes, if not more, and see her as a real person. Unless, of course, the character is Marie Antoinette, then I guess I assume that she's going to wear a different dress every five minutes. In fact, I will be disappointed if she's not wearing a different dress every five minutes. Beth also stays relatively humble in terms of wealth and fame, and that's something that I really liked, and that's something that was also reflected through her clothing and shopping choices. We see her coming back to Ben Snyder despite making lots more money. I just think it's a total cliche when the whole character development arc is this character going from rags to riches and then becoming like obnoxiously spoiled and pretentious and rude and distancing themselves from where they were or where they started in the past. It's a good storyline, like everyone loves it. I'm just tired of seeing it all the time. And even though I know this was based off a book, I'm really happy that the writer chose to pick a different character struggle for Beth. From 1963 to 1966, we see her wearing mostly circle skirts, full dresses, boat necklines, and button downs. She also finally gets a pair of saddle shoes that she envied from the beginning, which gives us a subtle indication that she does want to keep up with the trends. Even though by the mid-1960s, the mod look started to really take over, I think it still makes sense for Beth to be dressed in like late 50s, early 60s clothing when we look at the context. The 50s slash early 60s look was way more feminine than the mid to late 60s androgynous silhouette, so I believe that production opted for this full skirt, hourglass, hyper-feminine look when Beth is starting to win tournaments to further emphasize that she's doing all this as a girl. This is the rising point when people don't know her yet, her name's not in as many papers yet, and they still judge her for being a girl. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm sure. We don't have a women's section. I'll put you in beginners. I'm not a beginner. Doesn't matter. Elizabeth Harmon, a student at Fairfield High, showed a mastery of the game unequaled by any female, according to Harry Beltic, whom Miss Harmon defeated for the state crown. It's a major contrast to see a girl wearing what we stereotypically think of as 1950s housewife attire um, completely dominate a male majority sport. The visual juxtaposition of having her play against these men wearing these outfits is just a lot more striking. When her mother dies in 1966, Beth immediately goes through a fashion transformation. We see her shift from the circle skirts and full dresses to a sleek, off-duty, old Hollywood actress kind of style, complete with scarves and capri pants. Also, a very important thing to circle back on is that she doesn't wear pants until Alma dies. And yes, it's probably a cliche to be using pants as an indicator for independence and uh, maturity, but we also have to remember that the 1960s was a turning point for women, and um, women started to join the workforce more in significant numbers. They were tired of happy housewife American propaganda, and this was also the time when second wave feminism started to really become a thing. One of the major reasons for this shift was the fact that the birth control pill was federally approved in 1960. This allowed women more freedom from unwanted pregnancies and in turn allowed them to distance themselves from motherhood, if that's what they wanted. This is not to say that women didn't wear pants in the 50s. Women were wearing pants in the 50s, the 40s, even earlier in smaller numbers. Um, that's not what I'm trying to say. Please do not leave this video going off and telling your friends that women did not wear pants until the 1960s because that's just wrong. <laughs> But pants have traditionally been associated with work, and that's why women started to wear them in mass numbers to begin with. In the 1940s, when men were going off to fight in World War II, a lot of women had to step up to the plate and take on these previously men-dominated jobs um, to keep the economy going on the home front. 
And dresses and skirts were not always the practical work choice, so a lot of women started wearing pants. Second wave feminism was a lot about optics, if I'm going to be frank. Like a lot of women participated in events like bra burning and uh, mass disposal of feminine related products such as hair curlers and women's magazines. A lot of these second wave feminists also adopted pants as their everyday wardrobe choice. And that makes sense because pants at the time were still like on the verge of becoming gender neutral. They still had these like gendered undertones. And as I always say, fashion and culture are so unbelievably intertwined. In 1966, Yves Saint Laurent introduced the Le Smoking Women's Tuxedo Suit, and many credit him for sparking the androgynous fashion movement of the 60s. Of course, Saint Laurent's work is important on its own, and he's an artist, and I'm sure like people would love him regardless. But I think that if the public wasn't dying for this shift in gender norms, his suit wouldn't have taken off so much and it wouldn't have been such a culturally significant moment in fashion history. When Beth goes back to Kentucky after a tournament, she goes to Ben Snyder's and runs into her old high school classmate. First of all, uh, let's zoom in on that hat here. Fat be- Oh my god, what is that? Oh my god! What is that? But if you notice, her friend is wearing a fit and flare dress similar to the ones that were popular at the beginning of the series. Meanwhile, our protagonist Beth has completely revamped her look in a mohair cardigan, grid print sweater vest, jeans, a chunky belt, and canvas sneakers. Through using fashion, we clearly see how Beth has outgrown her high school peers. This girl who was once the very popular girl, the very fashionable girl, is now stuck in these outdated clothes in this very unhappy housewife position, whereas Beth is this free and independent spirit. All of this is visually emphasized via the clothing choices. She goes through another wardrobe transformation when she moves to New York. She becomes way more on trend and starts sporting a whole bunch of mod looks from this point onwards. We see her shopping at Saks Fifth, and then we see her shopping again when she gets to Paris at these fancy little boutiques. I really loved how they handled Beth's fashion progression in this show. Like, a poorly dressed Midwestern girl um, slowly and organically builds her wardrobe and becomes more fashionable as she moves to metropolitan cities. Uh, no, I'm not talking about Emily in Paris. And also as a side note, do I think that Beth needs to be well-dressed for this show? Well, yes and no. No, because it is a show about chess at the end of the day and her relationship with chess and you don't need to be well-dressed to play chess, though some characters would show otherwise. <laughs> but yes, because the story could have easily turned into one of those annoying stories about how this girl is not like the other girls and, you know, just play on some outdated tropes. She's the only girl who plays in the chess tournaments and she's constantly surrounded by men. It's basically the perfect setup. I think that they managed to avoid that and make Beth a lot more likable to today's audience by one, uh, showing her engage in healthy relationships with other women, and two, balancing her traditionally boyish interests with traditionally girly interests like fashion. Or you could give me the black dress. Or the purple one. <laughs> I like them. <laughs> Another turning point in the series is when she's hungover and loses her match in Paris to Borgov. I love this dress, but I think it also is very interesting for the narrative. If you notice, the dress is kind of like a pale green with dark green accents. And do you remember where else we've seen this color scheme? It's the pills, baby. The tranquilizer pills that she's been addicted to. She is literally wearing the pill, and it's no coincidence that after this match, she completely spirals and restarts her dependency on pills and alcohol. I just think that this visual representation of her going backwards down the slope is very subtle, but also really great. And if you think I'm reaching, actually a lot of her clothes carry motifs. Um, if you notice, she's constantly wearing check pattern, plaid pattern, basically any kind of geometric square grid pattern. And I think that was done purposely to make her resemble a chessboard. And if you don't believe me, um, let's just do a tally here of how many times she wears a geometrically square pattern.
And her final look is the piece de la resistance. We see her wearing a white coat, white pants, and a white hat. She looks exactly like a white queen chess piece. The resemblance is amazing and it's so fitting. It's a perfect reference to her winning match and the title and wraps the show up so nicely. So that's the last thing I have to say about the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the series, especially if you only watched it because I've been low-key promoting it on social media. If you didn't, I'm really sorry. Um, hopefully this review makes up for your lost eight hours of time. I'm going to sign off. I have a lot of vintage shopping to do. I realized while watching the show that I don't own like any 60s vintage and I'm on a desperate mission to change that. So I'll see you guys next time and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day.